Hello, hello, and welcome to the podcast. I am very lucky slash honoured to be joined by Mr. No BS Estate Agency himself, Mr. John Savage. John, thank you so much for making time to come on the podcast today. Chris, no, mate, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you uh, for actually inviting me on. This is um, this is super exciting. It's actually nice to be on the other side, um, being able to actually do all the talking, I suppose. Absolutely. I, I always enjoy interviewing podcasters because I feel like it's very much the other side of the fence and you spend a lot of time asking questions and being interested in other people sometimes it's nice for you to take a step back and go actually let's talk about John and what John's got going on and as, as we were speaking about just before we press record today you've got a lot going on so uh, we've got mm -hmm. loads of stuff to talk about today so for those who don't know know yourself at all take us back in time so you used to be in the paras um, you went to Iraq is that correct yes. Um, all that time ago so how do, how do you go from sort of Iraq to well then Winkworth by the looks of it yeah so that's actually like the the transition is like wow how do you go from being an elite level soldier uh to becoming an estate agent um so yeah I served in the parachute regiment for four and a half years um uh, served uh in Iraq luckily I've never fired around in anger so I've seen bombs and bullets but um yeah, I've never actually fired around an angle, which is good. Yeah, which is a good thing because people do often ask and I'm like, I have to make it clear that I've never done that. So, um, uh, however, that being said, massively proud of my um, time in the military. Uh, I absolutely loved it. It's probably one of the toughest things I've ever done in my life, just purely to get in. But then I was told my first child was going to be born when I was doing a tour of Northern Ireland. And I was like, right, I know where this is going. My battalion, one para was going from a airborne infantry role to become a special forces support group. And I was like, this is going only one way and I'm getting out. Now that I know that I'm going to have a kid, I can't be a dad uh, or I can't have a kid growing up without their dad. So decided to get out and it's like, well, what am I going to do? Saw this documentary on a company called Green & Co, which I believe Hampton's may have purchased. Um, and they were following around this negotiator and he was saying that he was carrying 140 pounds, wrong, 180 pounds on his back um, uh, during training. And I was like, I've come from an elite regiment where 96 of us started, 17 of us completed the course. And it was just a massive um attrition is what it was like literally that they didn't want you in the military they didn't want you in the parachute regiment so and i was like i never lifted 180 pound on my back but when i crossed the border into iraq i had 183 pound on my back and couldn't stand up literally right. could not stand up and that was because of the nature of the parachute regiment like literally you, you're taking everything you've got because no one's going to come to save you right so i was definitely thinking to myself i could 100 percent do his job but he definitely couldn't do mine Anyway, when I became an agent, I started working for Winkworth in Wilson Green, and I was the world's worst negotiator. Literally, I got more complaints than offers because buyers were saying to me, listen, you got this place on Warm Lane. I want to go and see it. And I was like, brilliant, booking them in. Do they have a mortgage in principle? Uh, do they have a solicitor? And then believing that that was um, all I needed to do to sell a property. Well, of course, they were complaining to my manager. And I was like, but how could they be complaining? They asked to go and see the property. And I showed them that they were right. I was wrong. Um, and to be honest, I absolutely hated the state agency. I hated it. I was like, what have I done? But because I had the kid on the way, I couldn't give up. I had to stick with it. And I was like, wow, this is, I'm doing boot inspections. I was hiding, literally hiding uh, around the corner in the pool car with my hand, with my head in my hands, like, what have I done? What have I done? What is this industry all about? I, all, all I could see was people stealing the eyes out of somebody else's head if they weren't looking. And it was just horrific. Or because I was no good and because of the complaints, I'd be standing on a street corner with a set of details like a prostitute, hoping and praying that the buyers would not turn up. Mm because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was going on. And it was just an industry where I was like, this is really bad and awful. And I begged my colleagues at the time, please tell me what you're, why are you coming back with offers? How are you tying these properties up? Well, of course, the nature of the beast is if somebody's got some secrets, they're going to keep them. And rightfully so keep them, because if they've had to learn, like hard graft to earn those secrets, then they're not just going to give them away. Um, and one of my colleagues ended up giving me three questions, which was just simply tell, explain, describe. That was it. And he said, that's how he's um, uh, getting offers on property. And of course, um, when he told me that, I then 
uh, for the next couple of years, perfected that and added a load more questions, which I've got a, a, a small course basically that I have, which is ask these questions, you will get an offer on the first property you show. And if you don't, they'll buy the second. Um, but it started to open up the buyers for me. And actually, I started going, ooh. Um, uh, and that's where, well, two years later, I become a sales manager. And then I had the same problem, but just at a different level. Now, I was telling the truth and not winning any instructions whatsoever. Literally, I was, if I thought I was bad as a negotiator, I just entered the lion's den of being beaten up and spat out by other agents that were winning instructions and I wasn't. But I'm like, now I'm really confused because I thought, oh, these guys are lying. These people are blatantly lying about the value of that property or what they're capable of and all the rest of it. And I'm telling the truth and I'm getting laughed at. Um, so then I had to learn all over again um, how to qualify sellers in a way in which made sense to them, despite me saying a hell of a lot less money than what other agents were saying in order to win. So I was like, oh, my God, because I can't lie to save my life. You know, if I had to lie, if I, if I was being interrogated, I'd be like, oh, what, what <laughs> I'll tell you everything. <laughs> don't, don't, don't need to punch me or like pull a finger down. I'll, I'll tell you anything <laughs> straight away it's fine um uh so i'll be yeah um and that's that's really it mate and then then it got to the stage where i felt like i needed to protect buyers and sellers you know and that's that's so if i'm honest the state agency as an industry i don't really like it it doesn't really float my boat it you could have the nicest house in the world you could have the most awful property in the world. I'm looking at the human that I'm talking to and actually finding a way for them to maximize the value of their property, whether it's the latest and greatest or whether it's like a pigsty. How do we mold and shape the perfect sale? What do we need to do in order to get there? And that's so, so that's where with like Zero BS Estate Agency is the um, TikTok channel and, and effectively the brand. It's more about protecting people and less about me winning instructions because I'm I'm not interested in winning instructions. And we've all done it as agents, right? Where we've taken on property and it's ended up making us ill yep. because we, we knew we shouldn't have taken it on, but we did. And we've ended up taking on the wrong client at the wrong price. Yeah, if you're unlucky, that's a double whammy, right? Sometimes you could have the right price, but the wrong client. And it's just, and it, you, so, so, I then started going, well, actually, no, no, I'm going to interview sellers. I'm going to interview the sellers, actually, and work out what's in their red. Because generally, when an agent turns up to a house, they're all pitching for the business, regardless of who the seller is and what their ideology is or what their thought processes are. It's about winning instructions and getting people tied into long contracts. But for me, it wasn't. I was like, nah, I'm not going to play this game no more. This is, no, I'm not doing it. So I needed to work out a way to tell the truth and get away with it. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, and that's was, a was it was it a conscious decision? Because I would say, from a outside perspective, looking in, that you are you are very much John Savage, and it's kind of some people look at it and they'll go, "John is the most amazing guy. He's straight talking. He's this and that." Other people will go, "He doesn't know what he's talking about. He does these stupid TikTok videos, all these sort of things." Was that a conscious decision to go, kind of? F you, I am who I am. And if you like me, great, you can work with me. That's absolutely fantastic. But if you don't want to work with me, then that's cool. Equally kind of go on. Was that ever a decision or did you just kind of fall into that sort of mindset? No. So that's, that's a really good question because um, 2007, um, I don't I don't care that I'm saying this right now, but Foxton's basically create the, built the model of overvaluing. And even in 2006, 2007, they were still doing it. And I was like, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it in such a good market? Mm. And what was happening in that good market is the values that they were giving, the amount of people that were looking to buy. So it was almost genius in a way. The amount of people looking to buy meant that they were reaching the exaggerated values because of the volume of people that were looking to purchase. Yeah, right? yeah, kind of the, the market sort of flattens you there slightly, doesn't it? If the market's rising at an alarming rate and you're overvaluing, it's like, well, wait 10 minutes, it'll catch up. Yeah, exactly. Right. But then, of course, that model doesn't work in a, and in, in, by the way, it wasn't always necessarily working for all sellers. So there were still sellers, even in a really buoyant market that was flying, there were buyers, buyers aren't stupid. 
buyers definitely when they start looking at properties online when they start going viewing properties with agents agents are trying to get deals done so they're telling the set the buyer what the real money is the sellers never hear those conversations right and then so they're just trying to get offers trying to get offers trying to get offers trying to get offers so there's me and i'm tearing my hair out and i said to my colleague john at the time i said how do we get inside everyone's head to just let them know what the real score is just for those sellers who want the truth they want a fantastic service they generally want to maximize the value of their home but they're willing to work with a methodology or a strategy in order to do it how do we get into their heads because going back to your point is like i'm not for everybody i know i'm not some people view me and go well i really like the way this guy thinks and there's lots of others that go this guy's just a dickhead yeah but that's okay that's okay because that's really not that I want to antagonize anybody, but that's what I want. I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste a client's time. and I don't want to waste the buyer's time. I want to make sure that everybody knows what the score is day one, week one, because ultimately that's how you keep a deal together. When you're, when there's um, ambiguity, when there's the bank of mum and dad's, when there's Terry down the pub, when there's Catherine in the office at the water cooler, when there's, and they, it's not just one buyer that's buying one property. If it's a couple, it's their parents also are going to have a say. It's all of their colleagues that are going to have a say. It's all of their friends that they know are going to have a say. And they could easily be swayed. And also, bear in mind, they've been given what the real money is, the pounds per square footage, by other agents for other similar properties they're looking at. And it's like, why, 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 why stitch the buyer up like that? Why allow so many um, conversations and opinions to happen that ends up pushes them off the pot? Whereas, what if you positioned your property in such a way that when the buyer turned up to work on Monday morning and said, I've been to see this property, and their colleagues go, oh, my God, that's incredible. Wow, you need to buy that. What about all the other buyers that are having the same conversations at the same water callers in different offices, right? And all their friends are going, oh, my God, wow, suddenly... Me as an agent, I've done all the hard work up front. I've positioned the property correctly. Well, all the good opinion of other people is now doing the work for me. And, and I can control the sale for my seller. So I that was, for me, I was like, it's about protecting people. So 2020 come along, um, obviously lockdown, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, TikTok. My kids are on TikTok. How did kids, how did TikTok work? And I thought, right, I think I can start telling the world how agency really works yeah and then that obviously ballooned because people enjoyed the content but then also as well it was really quite nice because other agents were going hang on a moment i'm pretty truthful too i'm actually pretty good at my job too i'm going to start creating videos and i'm going to start telling them what i think should i mean which is maybe different from me, but it's their truth. It's their methodology. It's their strategy of how they get things done because I believe in consequences. Mm. If and, I'm going to tell say, say something to someone, I better deliver. I and I better that. why I've just said what I've said. And that's what I believe in is consequences. Um, but yeah, so so I, I digressed a little bit then, but it was more about protecting people. And then um, 2007 my memories of that and then of course using tiktok to go right i think i can protect everybody because i'm not in everybody's area mm. I'm, I'm not going to be selling in everybody's area but if i can be part of their journey to give them um for example as an agent um nest in nest in essex uh nick cheshire and he was i saw a video that he did and i never knew nick at this time and he said he was being literally interviewed by a seller and he was like, oh, my God, this is great. But I do fill out of my depth slightly because I, this is unusual for this seller to be going at me with all these hard hitting questions. Right. It turned out this seller read my book, Zero BS uh -huh. Estate, and was asking him the questions. She then sent me a message unbeknownst. Um, he sent me a message when I contacted him to talk about coming on my podcast, Zero BS Estate, because of that video. But I didn't know it was her. He then sent me a message saying that she has spoken to this agent. This agent's amazing. But by the way, thank you so much for the question because it unearthed all the agents that are saying things that sounded nice. So I could just get rid of them. And then Nick, not only did he position the property correctly, he massive exceeded expectations. So she ended up meeting the exact right agent that actually has got a methodology because otherwise all the agents, they all look the same. We all say similar things. So how do you distinguish between who is actually a charlatan and who is the real McCoy. And it's difficult for a seller to do that, right? 
And how would you best convey that across to a homeowner? So let's say, for example, you're one of the three market appraisals that they have sort of thing. And let's just pick a nice round figure here. Let's say the property is actually worth £300,000 sort of thing. And you've got two estates, walks the front door, you go, yeah, you've got an amazing home. We could sell it, but I buy this queue around the block sort of thing. We can reckon we can get you 325 for this property. And then kind of get, how would you get across? Because I imagine there's, no matter what you say there, there's still that sort of, dangling sort of bit of whatever it may be in the future to go oh 25 grand 25 grand i know john's saying to us it might be worth 300 000 he'll definitely get it for us and competition and all this sort of stuff but 25 grand 25 grand how do you overcome that sort of shiny object of that extra money for that homeowner to convey that actually you're probably never going to get that 25 grand so there's there's a number of different questions that i would pose to the seller and uh two two questions i heard there was once I come back from another valuation and there was a guy working for us part time and he was doing an economics degree. And I come back and I was like, oh, my God, why are these sellers going for the big money? The stars in your eyes money, because they're getting themselves locked into a really long contract and the big money. It can happen if they give it to me, but it's not going to happen if they try to go for the big money. There's a methodology to get the big money. How? Why? Why are they doing this to themselves? Why are they imprisoning themselves? And he said to me, John, he said, John, have you heard of a, um, a cognitive bias called the anchoring effect? And I was like, no, what's that? And he said, well, basically, um, the anchoring effect is that people will make financial decisions based upon the highest figure that they hear. Right. Or the first or the highest figure that they hear. So they base every uh, decision consideration on that figure, even if it's real or not just because someone's told them. Now, bear in mind, of course, when somebody is looking at agencies online, they go right move, Zoopla, whatever, and they start looking at other similar properties to theirs in the local area, and they start going, well, mine's better than that. That's on for 325. Mine's nicer than that. Well, the agent's just come along, another agent's just come along, and they both said, yeah, 325 is the right money. Um, well, Mine's better than that. So I feel like I'm giving the buyer a bit of a bargain because mine's mine's much nicer, much better location. And John's saying 300 grand. This guy's an idiot, clearly doesn't know his market. And that's what that's what sellers used to accuse me of, by the way. And other agents will tell sellers that, that I didn't really know my market. I was pretty new, didn't really understand what I was doing, don't really understand the nuances. Um, so I would say that to a seller. But not only would I say that to a seller, I would also say this, and I got this from Tom Panos, and Tom Panos said it's not the um, uh, property's not in isolation, it's in competition. So I went one stage further off the back of that because I was like, well, that's just genius. So I would say to a seller, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, would you agree with me that property is not in isolation, it's in competition? And they would look at me blankly and I'll be like, right, so what I'm saying is if it was in isolation, you could name your price because you have got one of a kind. No one else has got a two bedroom flat like this. And they go, yeah, so right, so you're in competition. They go, yeah, so you're in competition with not just the property, another two bedroom flat on your road. You, you've got another one around the corner, another one in the postcode, another one, another one, another one. What about the surrounding postcodes that are within like a thousand to 2000 meters away from where we are right now? And just so as you know, Say if I was when the Labbert Grove when I was selling houses uh, for Winkworth when I was a sales manager, we were surrounded by five postcodes. So that would be like W11. We were in W10, but W11, NW6, um, parts of NW9, uh, certainly um, uh, uh, Northwest 10, as well as going into say Wembley and stuff like that. Suddenly you're in for, right. Well, you've got 300 other two bedroom flats on the market within a 2,000 meter radius of your home. So what are you going to do? to get all the very best buyers away from what they're currently looking at to come and see yours instead. Love that. Love that. Yeah. And that was just one of, one of the things that I would talk about because I wanted to set the scene. I wanted them to go, yeah. Oh, wow. Actually. And it's not me pitching for business. It's asking them what they're going to do to get all the very best buyers away from what they're currently looking at. And bear in mind, there's not, 327 other buyers really for this particular property that they've got on the market so if you want your 325 grand there's a way in which to get you that money but you must control the market if you don't control the market and you're just one of everything else then why is a buyer going to come to yours and if they do come to yours what is Catherine at the water caller going to say terry down the pub the bank of mum and dad they are all going to be doing the due diligence and not only that they're seeing all of these other properties and the agents are telling them what the real money is 
what the property price is really selling for. So you are up against it if you go from 325. And by the way, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I'm not saying you should give the property to me. What I am saying to you is, is that you should give your property to the agent you liked the most, but the one that said the least. And they'll be looking at me blankly again. I said, and I may not be that person, by the way, but you've got to think about this. You are going to be working with this individual and their colleagues, right? And the sales manager is generally a reflection of their colleagues. Yeah. So you're going to be working with the sales manager or the colleagues in the office for the next five or six months before you complete. And what if you've just been sped a yarn and now actually it's never going to happen. So effectively what I'm doing is I'm undermining the other agents without doing what they did to me, which is you shouldn't trust John, doesn't know his market, not been in the game long. He's undervaluing in order to, you know, sell, sell cheap to one of his developer mates and all. And it was like, wow, wow. And then it'd be like, so then I was able then, once I got buy-in, I'm able then not just to show the properties that I'm selling I and what they're actually achieving. I would actually, because agents have this tendency to pretend they're the only agent that exists. There's no other agent in the area. So they only show their properties. And I, and I knew this one of the agents around the corner was doing it. And he was just, just, it was just irritating me because he was going, right, so we've got this property on this two bedroom flat on, on this road. We've got this other two bedroom flat on this road. And it, and he showed them the marketing prices, which aligned with what the seller was seeing online, but he wasn't telling them actually what they were achieving or how long it actually took those properties to go under offer. Yeah. So I was like, I would just then, once I got buy-in, I would then lay out the details, not just of what I was selling, where it really worked and where it didn't. For example, there was a one bedroom flat. I was like, this is easy 350 grand easy 350 grand i can prove this to within a within an inch of its life guess what crickets crickets ended up getting offers at 330 right eventually sold it for 334 and it took me 66 days to get it under offer right and i was like oh my god what have i done this is this is bad right this is really bad and i was just apologizing to the seller that i got it that wrong right Another ex-local authority flat, one bedroom, pretty much exactly the same, but wasn't as nice. Didn't have a sort of an updated kitchen, you know, like bathrooms, et cetera. Um, and I said to the seller, I said, listen, please, we need to learn from the mistake I made here. Can we market your place, not for 350, but for 325? And I'll get you more than 325, but you've just got to trust me. Took me eight days and sold it for 340. Well, there you go. Six grand more. For, for actually, and this is the other thing, agents that wind me up. If you've been in an area for longer than three months, you know what the pounds per square footage is. You absolutely know what the pounds per square footage is, right? So how can you keep getting it wrong? You're getting it wrong. You're not delivering because you are going, well, what's agent A going to say? What's agent B going to say? What's agent they, I know what they're going to say, so I'm just going to say what they're going to say, but try and just be a little bit under what they're saying because I know it's not really the right money. And I don't give two craps. I'm like, if I win it, I win it. If I don't, I don't. If I don't win it, I've actually done myself a favor. But if I do win it and I come back to the office and my colleagues say to me, so what have you got? And I've got this and I've got it at 400 grand, for example. And I know the other agents are going to say 450. My colleagues, negotiators in the office, before I've even finished my sentence, I'll be on the phone to their buyers. Yep. And 400, by the way, is the right money. But we'll end up selling it for 410, 425. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's more, it's more about, it's not about me. It's about a seller being in control of the sale of their home and not just in control of the sale of their home. Cause ultimately they're the employer. They are the people that really should be interviewing agents. Hence my book, zero BS estate agency, given the 21 questions that sellers can ask. Yeah. Or even if they don't ask them, they can be aware of the questions that they should be asking and reason why. And then it gives them a choice. It gives them a choice. Do I do I trust this agent enough that they generally have a methodology or don't they? But at least if I'm interviewing them, just like if it was a job interview, if they're in the office and a corporate job or something, they would make sure somebody knows how to project manage. If somebody was like getting into a risk management role, they that risk management role would know the methodology of risk management, of mitigating risk. But generally sellers don't know what questions to ask. So they end up employing completely the wrong people. 
I guess that's, ex- that's, that's exactly it, isn't it? I think it's a, a case of a lack of lack of education on the vendor side of things. You know, the questions they probably ask is, do you have buyers for this property? Strangely enough, every estate agent around go, yeah, absolutely, loads of them. Thanks very much. Um, you know, what's what's the support like from your head office, your team sort of thing? Who's going to be doing the viewing sort of thing? What's your fee and what's your price? Mm. Sorry, that, that's probably that's probably it. That's probably the questions that most people go. That's my go-to. Anything outside of that, they go. I don't look stupid or say the wrong thing. So I think what you're doing with regard to giving um, vendors the power to say, this is going to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff very early on, just ask these questions and see what the answer is, is absolutely gold. And by the way, so um, when I was working for Winkworth at that time, I, I was lucky in the sense that I, James and Steve, that were franchise owners of that business, and they they backed me big time. They backed me to to tell the truth and work it out. And so I was lucky in that sense. Um. But if I'm an, an agent, just to tell you the stats that I had is when I was in that office working that location, we had over 105 agents that I was competing with in that location, right? And the 63 valuations I went on uh, up to the moment in that year that I left that particular business, um, the 44 that come to market, I won 41 instructions of which I sold 41, of which the average uh, selling price was 99.47%. And my average days on market was uh, 29.5 days, right? Mm. Compared with my competitors, 163 days on the market before going under offer. And their average was 94% valuation accuracy rate. And so, so, so it just shows you. And the thing is, none of my colleagues were wasting their time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, none of my sellers were wasting their time. Um, uh, and those those stats are insane. But that came from though that one knowing the anchoring effect, but also, and if I'm an agent right now listening to this, I am stealing, stealing properties not in isolation, it's in competition. And then before they go to a property, work out what is the competition. Yeah. And is that competition just in this postcode that they're operating in? Or do buyers have choice and buyers right now have a lot of choice yeah and so it means that um being a buyer's market but well how are we going to get those buyers into this property and then work out how to position the property best because you could have two flats in the same block with different aspects in the block and one aspect is worth 50 grand more than the other aspect despite being in the same block so how are we going to get what's the methodology to get us the, the 50 grand extra what is that methodology? Do you know what I mean? And and talk our sellers through that, what we believe that methodology is based upon provable facts. Um well, so I had I had Elaine Penhill on the podcast a little while ago um from uh, Lemon and Lime Interior, so interior um preparation, I suppose. Um and we were talking about sort of the the tinderfication, uh, if that's even a word, um, of mm-hmm. property market and how right move is effectively a sort of turning into tinder for your house so you know you need to get across quickly how you are you know a good property good looking well presented this to the right sort of buyer right price because otherwise about two seconds later flick on to the next one and you're gone and you're out of contention very quickly and it's kind of that and more and more society is going in that direction where we expect sort of perfection in front of ourselves you know we go on the internet every picture is photoshopped and tidied up and whatever else it might be so if your property isn't presented in the best possible way, in the best possible light, with the best photographs and the best strategy and the best pricing behind it, flick on the next one and you yeah. go. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can totally, 100% agree with that completely. And that that goes on to part of the, um, the, the mini course I have, which is basically for negotiators and asking the right questions. That is surrounded within consumer psychology. Yep. And everything you just said is absolute truth, um, fact that... You know, look, people people don't want cheap. People want bargains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love that. Right. And and so if we if we can if if a seller is thinking along those lines, then that's not too different or any different to the way that they're thinking about their next chapter in their life, which is the next property. They don't want cheap, they want a bargain. Yeah. And so of course, how do we position the property to look like a bargain to make sure? Because the thing is, I mean, I know like my question on my podcast, right, is what is the one thing that truly maximizes the value of someone's home when they go to sell their property? Now, of course, as you've just highlighted, there are a gazillion different answers, right? But the I I and I I say is price. You could have the worst pictures, the worst negotiators, 
right? The worst agent ever looking after you, but if the price is correct, you yeah. will attract the top buyers because without the buyers are without yeah? a doubt. Right. And so, yeah, I know that it's not just price because you, you, but at the same time, that's why I say it's price is because, and not every agent says price, agents say, no, it's the marketing. How good is the marketing? How good is the methodology or strategy? How good are, is the pictures? How good are the agents at negotiating? So it's loads of different things that come into it. So I'm not going to sell it cheap. But ultimately, if you're a seller, it's like the, if the price is compelling and that means you control the market that then means that you stand more of a chance in actually selling in your terms rather than the agent's terms. Love that. So I'm going to pick up on something you mentioned earlier about your TikTok account. So mm. uh, for those who haven't checked out John on TikTok, check him out. Type in John Savage on TikTok, comes up straight away, which is always a good sign. Um, I went to a bit of a rabbit hole the other day because obviously I'm researching for the podcast today. I don't usually watch TikTok because I'm too terrified it's going to learn what I like and what I don't like and it's going to like suck <laughs> me in for four hours at a time. Um, but I was scrolling through your TikToks and I was like, this is some really good stuff there. And effectively... I think what you've become is the like unofficial internet advisor for buyers and sellers. Um, Cause you, most of your video content these is people who've asked you questions or replied to videos you've done already replied to other people's comments saying, I'm a first time buyer and I've just done this. And so-and-so said this, what do I do? Or I think I'm overpaying for this property. What are my options? And you're just like, right, these are your options. This is what you can do. This is what you should do. This is what your agents thinking, et cetera. So my question is, if you're going to restart your social media accounts all over again and you were a blank canvas from today, what would you change from when you first started compared to what you know now? Uh, I wouldn't change anything. Um, I'm a firm believer in I like the way that guy or girl thinks. And so my first video I ever did, I was so nervous so nervous um and i was like do i say this do i not say it how am i gonna look oh my god um and it was about um uh two agents and negotiators basically telling negotiators do not ask details questions do not ask details questions. Yes, I know you want to know whether they've got a mortgage in principle. I know you want to know whether they've um, got a solicitor. I know you want to know um, if they've seen some other property. I know you want to know their telephone number, their home address. I know you want to know um, where their deposit is, how big it is. So I know you want to, but don't ask them. Do not ask them those questions. That buyer has called up a gazillion different agents to go and see other properties and you're doing what I used to do, and then you find yourself getting complaints. And if they've not complained about you, right, trust me, they're, they're thinking of complaining about you because they spend up 10, 15 minutes on the phone just registering their details before they are allowed to go and see a property. So do not ask details questions. I got smashed up in the comments off the back of that video with agents going, you are wrong, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing. This is poor advice. You shouldn't be giving it. Who who the hell are you? Because I don't look like an agent, right? Uh, what is, you know, like, and and it was just like, actually, no, I'm going to stick up for myself and I'm going to tell you the reasons why. And then it just comes down to that. Well, what, what is the purpose of my TikTok? It's to protect people. And if it's to protect people, that comes before anything. So would I change anything? No. I suppose the only thing I would change and it's probably me being lazy, is probably I've got like thousands and thousands and thousands of comments and questions. And if I'd have just logged all of those thousands and thousands and thousands of questions and comments and actually put it into a data sheet, a spreadsheet, it would give me even more content. Yeah. Uh, I feel like you've got so much content now because I think from what I can see now, most of your videos are just replying to people. People ask you questions in the comments and it's just video, you know, question after question after question. I mean, you, you must have, all right, I've got a bit of a dry day today. Right there, scroll to comment number one. Right, that's a video. Scroll to comment number two. That's another video. You must, have, you must be tripping over content at the moment. Because there's this thing about like, if you if you have ever um, come across Russell Brunson. Yeah. And, yeah, right. So Russell Brunson talks about like um, the two elements of being vanilla. So you've got, two extremes to the right and to the left and those extremes are too hard hitting then you've got the center ground right which is the middle ground being completely vanilla saying and doing what everybody else says and does right but then there's you as the individual well who are you what do you represent why are you on earth what's your mission right and 
so I'm not saying, so for example, if you look at um, uh, Tanya Baker, right? Tanya Baker on her Instagram and her TikTok has massively blown up, massively blown up. And I'm not responsible for this, by the way, right? But we did have a conversation, Tanya and I, about three years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And she was like, John, I'm not you. I'm not you, but I want to start doing videos. And I said, Tanya, your brand is amazing. You, you are able to do something I am not. You are able to put flowers around words and just come across so well and so lovely and beautiful and tell a really good story. And I sent her a message the other day and said, oh, my God, how have you not got your own TV show? Yeah, your own property TV show. Because her videos are amazing, but she is her. She is representing Tanya Bacon the way, if you look at any of her marketing, it is flowers round words. Yeah. Me, I can't do that. I cannot do that. I am just like, I'm in your face. I'm going to tell you the truth. And if you, I don't care whether you like it or not, because I'm only telling you the truth because I want the best for you. Yeah. She's doing it in another way, which is her brand and it works perfectly. So um, if I'm anybody thinking about um, doing their own TikTok and I would tell anybody to do their own TikTok or their own blog or their own YouTube video channels, whatever, but just be them. Don't try and be like someone else. Just be them because ultimately they have to stand by them. And if they're not true to themselves and they're not coming across with the right personality, they're going to get found out because they'll give up. Number one, they won't keep coming back. And when somebody does question something and then there's like a hundred comments questioning the advice and they know in their hearts of hearts that that advice is completely correct. They will go to war mm. with all of those answers with all of those answers. And that's why I keep coming back on the TikToks and keep doing them because I'm like, no, what's right is right. And what's wrong is wrong. It doesn't, and it, it has nothing. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be like the biggest agent in the world. I'm not going to be the biggest agent in the UK. That's not the intention. But if I can help, um, that's my mission is if I can help a, uh, a seller or a buyer actually get the right result, including agents that want to listen, yeah, then that is good. And so I I get um, questions and comments on my DMs from agents going, oh, my God, John, thank you so much, mate. I've learned so much. Well, guess what I learned so much from? People like you, people like Tanya, people like um, uh, Tom Panos, John McGraw, people like Chris Watkin, people like uh, Chris Arnold, people like Keith Allen, people, you know, and, and actually listening into them and going, oh, my God. I love what they are talking about, what they're saying, and I am learning so much. Perry Power, Michael Bailey, um, you, all these guys work for completely different brands, but are all doing incredibly well. Chris uh, Buckler, just they know what they're doing, and I'm learning from them as well. And so, a case of if um, if there's other agents out there, and especially buyers and sellers, that's that's my mission. I, and that's so I don't care what I say. People said, one lady said to me once on one of my TikTok lives, she said, I would never give you one of my properties because you swear. Um, and I was like, well, I, I can't apologize for that. I won't apologize for that. But I said to her on this live, I said, there is only one swear word you are not allowed to say in my house. And it begins with C and it ends in T. And I then followed that up with by it's not the word that you just thought. Mm -hmm. C-A-N-T is the only word I'm not allowed to say in my house. So if my kids called me a C-U-N-T, I would let that slide. If they then said, I mean, obviously they wouldn't do that out in public, but if they then said... <laughs> oh, behind closed doors, that stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if they said that in... Um, obviously, there's etiquette, right? But if they said that, if they said, I can't do something, that's when I lose my temper. Yeah. In the sense, I'm like, oh, kids, get away from me. I'm not even having this conversation. When you work out how you can, then come back and have a conversation with me. But right now, don't tell me you can't, because that's the worst thing in the world. And that lady as well, when I asked her where she was and she said Notting Hill, and then I explained to her what my average days on market was, um, my average valuation accuracy rate of what I was achieving for sellers and how long my competitors were and what they were achieving for their sellers meant I was like, look, so on a 500 grand property, that's about 20 grand to you that I'm actually giving you in your back pocket and you wouldn't give me your property because I swear. Well, that's good because we've just worked out that I'm not right for you. Yeah, that's good. So I'm not going to waste my time trying to impress you. Yeah, 
of course, I don't want to irritate you. I don't want to annoy you. And I want to be friends with everybody, but I'm not going to be friends with everyone. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think really for it's taken a stance and an individual stance and generally believe in um, if you believe what you believe and you genuinely believe it and you can work out a way in which to get that message across, which massively benefits your client, i.e. the seller, um, uh, and deliver on what you said you were going to deliver on with your methodology, then run with it. And do you, do you still get affected by, I don't say the hate, but I'm sure you post a video now and again, everyone's like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about or you're wrong and you think left and I think right sort of thing. Do you even give that the time of day these days or would you just go, eh? I love it. Okay. I absolutely love it. I love it because they give me the ability to, again, be me. So if if anyone went to my TikTok channel right now, um, without getting too political, I didn't vote. I don't vote, right? And I said, guys, do not vote. Your vote holds massive power, right? The reason not for voting is because if you don't vote, what are the MPs that keep doing U-turns off the back of their manifestos? What are they going to do? And I've been absolutely like one video I did, right? I think it got... 40 likes, but 171 comments. Wow. Probably 80% of them telling me I'm wrong. Well, why is that good for my brand? That's good for my brand because I believe in consequences. I believe if you're a politician and you've been sitting there for the last four years waiting to get into power, that's four years of understanding what works and what doesn't work. So when you come up with your manifesto, I'm hoping you've gone, right, we've seen what doesn't work. We've done, done the analysis. We've looked at the background. Actually, probably what would work is X, Y, and Z. If you're going to tell me that in the manifesto and I'm going to be voting for you in that manifesto and then you can just change your opinion, actually, we're not going to do that now. No, no, no. I voted for you to do that. You can't change. Yeah, but another MP said we can't do it. No, 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 no. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. And that's why with, with, with agency, I am so strict on no consequences. If I'm an agent and I'm going to tell a seller that I'm going to achieve X, Y, and Z, I better go and achieve X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Otherwise, I've got to sell that property for free. Good. You've, you've segued segway me absolutely beautifully here. So one of the TikToks I watched um, on your account was your five questions that every seller should be asking their estate agent who come around to the property. So talk me through those five questions. That's going to link in quite nicely what you just mentioned there, I would, as I would believe. Yeah. So, 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 right. So the 21 questions, the actual book itself, right? The, 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 the seller should be aware of the answers to those questions. Yeah. So they can start to work out, does this agent, are they just saying things that sound nice in order to win instruction or they actually got their fingers on the pulse and they know what they're doing or they at least know what's happening inside the market. Right. Um, so if you take, say, my area, Marlow, at the moment, on average, every month, there's about six to seven properties that are completing. There's currently about 131 properties that are on the market right now uh, for sale. But if you think six or seven completions in a month between 12 agents, not a lot. Not a lot. So what are those agents going to say? They are going to say things that sound nice in order to get those sellers into contract, right? In order just to get them into contract to keep their office doors open. What they're not going to say to a seller is, well, at the moment, on average, there's six to seven properties that are just selling. They're not going to, well, I will. Yeah. Because I want to manage expectations of where we are right now. Right. So but equally, the 21 questions are not necessarily going to ask them, but they are going to ask what I always tell sellers to ask, which is at least these five questions. So Mr. Agent or Mrs. Agent, how much is my property worth? That's number one, right? So they then write the answer down. So the agent says 300 grand. They said, right, so what would you market my property for? Yeah. So the seller is looking for that agent to say 300 grand, right? And they say, right, so what price point We'll get the 10 very best buyers round here right now. They are hoping that agent says 300 grand, right? They then say, right, let's just imagine that we're now 30 days from going to market. Every You've just said to me 300 grand and everything else you've just said to me isn't working. What's plan B? How are we going to get this show back on the road at the price point you're telling me? 
they better have a bloody answer. Mm -hmm. Because the actual answer is, no, 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 no. What we're going to be doing is doing it right in the first place so we don't have to worry about plan B. Because if we're worried about plan B, I've just stitched you up. Right? Now, the last question is, if the if the seller didn't just say what I just said, the last question is, is okay, fine. So if you don't deliver on your price promise at 300 grand, will you sell my property for free? Now, there's a massive caveat that sellers must, if they're listening to this, need to understand, is that 99.999999% of sell, uh, agents will not, will not sell a property for free right difference is i will and i'll tell you for why in a second but the reason i've just said that with that great big caveat is you're not really looking necessarily for the agent to sell your property for free but what you are looking for is the whites in their eyes and to see how they react and if they absolutely crap themselves and or they don't have an answer as to the reasons why they won't yeah, then you are dealing with somebody that is actually just lied to you. So it's a bit of a bit of a I would say bluff is probably the wrong word, but it's a bit of a bit of a play to kind of get them to show their true colours effectively. Absolutely. So if you take it just a step back, my colleague John, I told you about when we were 2007, how do we get inside everybody's head? Um, John said to, when I was talking to him, he he said to me um, uh, recently that he's got a, like a, a flat in Pinner. He basically called three agents about actually getting an up to date valuation. And he also was thinking about, do I need to sell the flat right now? So he called them up and he said, right, Agent A, this is opening gambit. I've just spoken to Agent B and Agent C, and they've just told me, no way, shape or form, I should be inviting you to come and value my property. Can you tell me why that is or what you would say actually to deflect that? He then called Agent B and Agent C and did the same thing. So Agent B, I've just spoken to Agent A, spoke to Agent C, and they've just told me, uh, do you know what all of them said? Go on. Can we call you back? <laughs> do, you, do you know what none of them did? <laughs> Called him back. Called him back. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Imagine, imagine that. And that is why I say, if you're an agent, I want to know what those 21 questions are. If I'm an agent, I want to know what those 21 questions are. Because if I know what those 21 questions are, when a seller calls up and says something like that, even the negotiator not the manager, the negotiator at the lowest level that understands the business can go, right, uh, wow, that's interesting because my days on market is this, my valuation accuracy rate is this, these are the testimonials that I've got, this is actually the pounds per square footage in your road right now, have you seen my TikTok channel, have you seen the blog that I write telling everybody, you know what I mean, all of these different things, so it's really interesting those guys have said that, I apologise that they've said that to you, but that's wrong because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Wow. What's the, what's the seller thinking? And that's the level of confidence that a seller should be looking for from the agent. So how much is my property worth, number one? Uh, what would you market my property for? Actually, the place is worth 300 grand, provable. That's what surveyors are gonna be looking for when the property goes under offer. But maybe we put it down at 290, because if we do it 290, we're definitely controlling the market. Obviously, we need to know what we're doing when we're doing um, buyer qualification. Um, uh, and that sets the tone, right? But it just means the agent is able to actually answer those questions. And when a seller is looking for those agents to answer those questions, if the agent is aren't able to answer those questions, what is the agent representing the seller going to be like in front of the buyers when the buyers start asking some hard-hitting questions? Does the agent actually fully appreciate the property? fully understand the nuances, fully understand the, what's happening in the area economically? Do they understand what's happening uh, uh, outside of their local area economically, internationally? Do they understand it and how that's going to affect things? They, the agent almost wants to take off, and the seller, by the way, wants to take off all of those buyer objections off the table. Well, but so it doesn't, so I don't care that there's wires hanging out of the wall. I don't care that the carpet's not right, that it needs to be changed. I don't care that I need to repaint this property. I don't care. Mum, dad, you told me you are giving me 20 grand or deposit to get this house, right? You're giving it to me, yeah? When when Catherine at the water cooler or Terry down the pub, when they have a negative opinion, but the buyer is more knowledgeable than most estate agents and they understand what the prices are and the price matches the property, whether it's good or bad, trust me, they've got competition. 
they need to act fast. Yeah. Mm. They, and that's what the, that's so, so now I'm not trying to negotiate with a, a buyer to buy the property. The buyer is trying to negotiate with me why they should have the property. And I'm representing my seller. So I'm now not trying to, you know, oh, well, you look, just, just put an offer in, just put an offer in. I'm not doing that. I'm controlling the process. And that's what they're looking for with those questions. How much is my property worth? What would you market my property for? What price point would we get the 10 very best buyers around here right now? Um, if in 30 days time, it's not worked, right? What's plan B? There shouldn't be a plan B. It should it's always work with plan A. And will we sell my property for free should you fail to deliver on your price promise? Love those a lot. Love those a lot. Very to the point, very direct, very John Savage. Love it. Well, it's basically, but also it's, it's accountability, right? Absolutely. Put, puts their money where their mouth is and you know what the, what good looks like and therefore you know exactly what bad is going to look like should the wrong words come out of their mouth. I love that yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that, and that, that leads then into... So let's say I've got a, a property and my fee is two percent, and it's five hundred grand. And the agent and the seller gives the property to an agent who's charging one percent. But the agent is just not performing because they said five twenty five, five thirty in the beginning. It's languishing on the market. Now you've got the third wave of buyer, who is the bargain hunter. They're going to be chipping away big time. The agents in the office, some of which are incentivized, they get paid a commission if they can get whoever gets it sold at the lowest level, right? Which I found astonishing. I found that out about one agency recently, and it was just like, wow, from the horse's mouth, from somebody on the inside, disgusted. Um, so they're, they're at 1%. Well, 1% is a great fee. It's an amazing fee. Uh, yeah, if they deliver. Mm -hmm. If they deliver exactly what they said they're going to win or exceed expectations. But now... They end up achieving offers that say 488, 485. Well, they're still going to get paid 1%. What's that? Say, call it easy maths, five grand, right? Yeah. Five grand fee. So now we're at for 483 is what the seller's just got. But I'm at 2% and my fee's 10 grand. Well, I've just saved that seller seven grand. Seven grand, I've just saved them. But my fee's 2%. But actually, I'm less expensive. And not only that, if I don't deliver, and I've agreed to sell the property to free, if I don't deliver, well, if they end up selling for, say, the 488 or the 490 or the 495, whatever it is below that 500 grand mark, that's a massive saving that seller's just got. Now, of course, I'm not going to sell every single property for the price point I'm telling them I'm going to sell for. But that's not the point. It's not about me. And if I'm an expert, and I'm guiding a seller who's trusted me as an agent to deliver exactly what I said I was going to deliver, then I better be expert. I better have my finger on the pulse. And all agents, by the way, absolutely have their finger on the pulse. They All of them know exactly what the pounds per square footage is, exactly what something's going to sell for to within 100 or, or maybe, I don't know, a grand, right? They know. They may not know what it will eventually go above the asking price, but they certainly know what the provable money is. It's just whether they choose to say that. And that's why those five questions are so powerful for a seller to ask. Um, Pretty good. One, one of my clients I work with who works with um, high-end property, so average house price, one million, two million quid sort of direction. Um, she adamantly will say, I'm the cheapest estate agent you're going to call out today. And she'll go, I'm the cheapest estate agent you can call out today because on average, I get you this much for much more than any other estate agent. She did one the other day where she got 150 grand over the asking price and she was like, mm -hmm. I'm the cheapest estate agent. I've just made you guys yeah. 150 grand. It's almost irrelevant what my fee is off the back of that because I've just made you at least 100,000 pounds on top of it sort of thing off the back of it. So it's about looking at that sort of long-term picture and big view on it. Yeah, absolutely. And just a very quick story on that. I had a seller once that said to me, John, I'm not going to give you this property because you've clearly overvalued in order to win the instruction. And I was like, right, I haven't. I haven't, but I want one viewing. I don't want you to sign my contract. You, you cannot sign my contract because, and I definitely don't want you to market the property. You cannot market and you cannot sign my contract, right? Because if I get this wrong after marketing and you've signed my contract, you're locked into me. And that's not right. And yes, I'm saying £80,000 more than three other agents, right? But give me that one viewing. I sold it for 530000 My fee at the time was 1.5%. And that's all I asked him to do, just email me to say, if I do sell it, you're going to pay me my 1.5% fee at that time. And that's what they did. Um, um, I've just generated an extra eighty grand because I knew exactly what I was doing. 
I knew exactly what I was doing and I knew exactly what was in the market, what wasn't in the market. And I'm not going to have that scenario every single time, but I'm going to have my fingers on the pulse and I'm going to know. And the difference is, is that if, if, if I never actually achieved what I said I was going to achieve, he still won because I've not now got the property. I've been sacked. Yeah. Like a bad football manager that's just not producing results. So I've been sacked. Um, but he hasn't exposed his property to the market at the big money. Mm. He's not exposed it. Yep. So, it's, so it means that he wins still because the moment you expose your property at the wrong price, that's it. Like you said, and you are so correct, Tinder, right move, Tinder for sellers, uh, buyers, right? Flicking and scrolling through. I was, I was, if I'd have marketed that property, I would have stitched him up potentially badly. Badly, badly, badly. And so, um, yeah, I, I delivered exactly what I said I was because I knew what was going on around me. And agents know what's going on around them. It's just whether they decide to tell the truth or not. And if they're not going to tell the truth, OK, ask these questions. And then that um, means that you will see in real time how they handle it. Brilliant. So so talk to me about Marlowe Uncovered. Yeah. So, so, so here's another thing, right? Agents are distrusted before they say a word and disliked before they walk through a front door. Straight away, instantly, yeah, bad rep, right? So Marlow Uncovered, I did the same thing when I was in Labour Grove, um, and that was called I Love the Grove, where basically I interview businesses um, uh, about them, organisations, um, other people running charitable events, well, what are they doing? What's the one thing that most small businesses don't have? Money. What's the one thing that they want? Leads, customers. Can I create? them an audio business card which is all about them their unique selling points what they stand for what they're selling what services or products that they've actually got that other people can go on itunes spotify and listen to in the local area um uh and do it for free do it completely for free and so marlo uncovered is basically to make sure that when someone goes to my TikTok and they see TikTok and they say, my good God, this guy's a bit straightforward, a um, bit straight talking, either I like it or I don't like it. But then they see the Marlow Uncovered bit and they go, wow, that's really cool. He's advertising these businesses through the Facebook, local Facebook groups with, so someone's not just seeing the product or the service, they're seeing and listening to the person behind the product or the service, right? And it just means that they then have an audio business card that they can send out to potential customers or they can actually put on other people's Facebook walls, right, for other people to listen to. Um, and that person, the listener, can fall in love with the actual individual and understand why they run the business that they run or why they run the charitable event or why they do what they do. We got like people that called the Marlowe Wombles. And I was like, Marlowe Wombles, who, who are they? What do they do? And there are people, part of the Marlow Wombles, that go around and litter pick. Oh, that's good. Man. That is brilliant. They are so, like, conscious about, like, the environment and litter picking. There's another one that I interviewed, Wild Marlow, which is all about the birds and the migration of birds that come through Marlow. Oh, my God, you're coming on the podcast. The Marlow Rowing Club. Well, what? who are they? What do they represent? They've got Olympic-level gold medalists that have been training that come directly from there, represented Great Britain. It's phenomenal. So by by actually getting deep and dirty with the underground of the area that we live, and I will tell every single agent in your area, start when you go into an office and go, oh, yes, I'm a new agent in the area. Um, Here's my business guard. Who cares? Who cares? No one. But if I go in there and you're running a business, I say, hi, Chris, I'm John. Do you have a voice for radio? Not a lot of people do, right? Because a lot of people don't like the sound of their own voice. But if you're up for it, I run a podcast on iTunes and Spotify called Marlo Uncovered, where effectively I create audio business cards for free. There's no catch, literally, other than spending half an hour with you to basically find out who you are, what you do, why you do what you do, the products and services that you sell, and how people can get in contact with you. I need you for about 20-minute recording. Not everybody does. Not everybody wants to. But the point is, it just means that the local Civ Pop can get to understand that John's not your typical agent, that Chris isn't your typical agent. Actually, they care about the location that they're in as well. Um, so, 
uh, yeah, and why why not why not extend that that olive branch to businesses that small businesses that may not necessarily have the money to advertise or may not know necessarily what well, can I help them? I'm I'm so glad you're doing that because i'll tell you why because I, I think it's a the next step in a state agency with regard to sort of market penetration and getting known the local area i think it absolutely is doing that um it's no secret that i'm one third of my way i would say to be optimistic through book number two at the moment and one of the chapters i wrote about two three months ago is literally exactly that and it's having your local podcast having local charities on the pta having the local clubs on there talk about the local area local 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 get across who you are as an individual it's great for the local businesses it's good to kind of get yourself part of the community as well i think that's a brilliant thing to do so um if everybody's listening to this that's a really like golden nugget to take away but it's a really easy thing to do you know we're doing this now over zoom there's no kind of high-tech stuff here at all we'll strip the sound out of it that with the podcast and thank you very much sort of thing so um yeah i think that's absolutely brilliant John. and one, one one last on that right um uh is door knocking yep so uh sally asling who is a uh recruiter uh yep. within the state she told me a story of when she was doing lettings and effectively lost her job in a big corporate business um she's very much similar to say like my sort of attitude and that wasn't really resonating for the corporate business so literally lost her job um she said she had like five grand left in the bank like i got bills of three thousand eight hundred how am I going to replace this? So as opposed to door knocking, she did door knocking with a twist. And I love this. She approached the local primary schools and said, what do you need? And if I can help you get what you need, is that okay? So one of the local primary schools said, we need pennies for the cookery classes for the young kids, right? Um, but they're 1200 quid and we don't have, we don't have the, the finances to do that. She said, all right, fine, leave it with me. She went out door knocking with a specific aim of raising money for the pennies for the children. And you know what the question that most of those people asked her at the door? So what is this you do? Do you actually work for the school? She said, no, I'm a letting agent. Like oh, that. you couldn't come in and just tell me what my place is worth, could you? OK. And she said she just got a number of different instructions to at least basically break even in her first month. And that was because she cares about a local community and wanted to go. I don't want to door knock. Mm -hmm. I don't want to door knock. Yeah, I don't want to be seen as just another agent, but I do care about the community. And what can I do for it? And so she ended up raising the money for the pennies. Oh, and by the way, she had Sally Asling um, embroidered on each of the pennies as well. Amazing. John, you've been an amazing guest, mate. I'm not even going to beat around the bush. You've been an amazing guest. Thank you so much for coming on. I think we've broken the record for the longest podcast we've done on the Estate and Consultancy podcast. So that's only a good sign. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the gold. It's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much for coming on. Mate, you've been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to um, talk about me, which is great. Really, mate, you've got many good stories, many good aspects, views on everything. So absolutely gold from start to finish. Thank you so much, John.